All right, uh, welcome fellow druids. Uh, this is another installment in my um, identity series. This is the third installment. Um, again, I'm not gonna go completely into what this is about, uh, but if you um, <clears throat> if you wanna find out, if like if this is the first one you're seeing, go back and watch. Um, uh, the first two episodes should have already dropped by the time I'm recording this, and then they're out there you should be able to find a playlist if you didn't find it already that says um identity on it and you'll find the other episodes there they should be in order so make sure you watch those we started with mark one we've worked through mark two uh and today here in, in a minute we're going to look at the beginning of mark three um as i said at first we're going to kind of go through uh the history and then we're going to kind of go to where we are and and maybe just see uh, where things are landing. Uh, I know I've gotten some comments on the first two videos at this point now that they've posted. Uh, so just to, uh, I don't want to uh, say necessarily to address them, but to comment, uh, I just want to remind everybody that this is how I see uh, the identity of Circle and the direction of Circle and the direction it has gone in. Um, not everybody is going to agree with me. I don't expect everybody to agree with me. Um, Hopefully not everybody disagrees with me entirely. That would be great. But, um, you know, uh, identity is not really a thing that belongs to any one person. I would encourage everybody as they're listening to these things and they're looking uh, at things. Um, a, uh, I just want to point out that I'm coming at this from, a, I am approaching this subject from a place of positivity. Um, if you're not in a place where you're doing that uh that's your prerogative but just realize that's how i'm looking at this uh, the purpose of the series will not be to say this is definitively what i expect privateer press should change about the entire faction or something like that so if if you are expecting that from me you, you'll probably be disappointed i'm intending to take this and look at how our identity has evolved how it's changed um things maybe it's lost things it's gained um, and to try to get both for myself and maybe for anybody who's viewing to get to a place where, um, where circle has an identity, um, or their identity is apparent or, and that's not to say, like I said, that I'm just cause I'm approaching it with uh, a positive mindset. That doesn't mean that everything will be perfect. That's not, uh, necessarily what I'm saying as, um, I look at this, I, because there's things that I would love to change too, and we'll probably we may get into talking a few of those, uh, talking about a few of those as the series uh, evolves. But uh, what I'm not, I'm not looking to to tear something down here and, and throw blame around or anything. So don't look for that from me. Um, you're welcome to do that, on, you know, as you see fit. But um, it's not my, that's not what I find interesting about this. So. Um, Anyways, what I want to go to with that brief little uh, soapbox moment aside, where I want to go from here is when Mark III rolled out, I'm going to switch my view here, we got this Insider article. And a lot of people have talked a lot about this. You know, this is sort of the, um, as Circle evolved from Mark II into Mark III, this was the information that we were presented with. Um, and I think realistically speaking i don't believe privateer press has ever um has ever like changed anything from this so as to the best of our knowledge and that doesn't mean that that something has not evolved but to the best of our knowledge uh what is in here is still still the situation that that people or that privateer press the company believes our faction is in so um we're gonna go through this i'm gonna i'm gonna try to talk about sort of talk about it bit by bit we'll focus on a little more some stuff more than others um and just see how this applies and we'll be starting to think about um we're sort of thinking about this in the light of i started in mark two i'm headed to mark three okay um obviously we are now in mark three so i'm not gonna like pretend we don't know how certain things play and whatnot um but that's what we want to talk about here so um, in this first paragraph, uh, Jason starts talking, uh, uh, Jason Souls is the lead developer at Privateer Press, if you're unfamiliar. Um, 
he's been the lead developer through every single one of these editions. Um, you know, the guy has shaped this game in its entirety. So, um, you know, uh, there weren't, he wasn't necessarily the only one <clears throat> posting this, but, um, and he's certainly not the only one in the, in the company that cares about our faction or anything. Just, he's the one that happened to do it. So just a little background for anybody who hadn't read. Um, so he starts talking off about, um, Circle being characterized by a menagerie of wild beasts, dark rituals, potent magics, or sorry, potent elemental magics, and boundless maneuverability. Uh, guerrilla army of druidic spellcaster savage warriors who strike the warning the weakest spot in the enemy line circle has access to some ranged skilled sorry skilled ranged combatants it is melee where its forces excel above all circles defined by its unparalleled ability to move across the battlefield and turn train uh, against its enemy in other words uh, circle knows the lay of the land um and then the, the next section uh talks about being hard to predict Lots of access to flight, Pathfinder, things that generate terrain. Um, not just moving through terrain, but placing terrain. So sort of a, a control element uh, implication there. Um, where it can hamper its opponent the most. It also has plenty of place effects that enable endless means of escape and vectors of attack. So um, before we go farther, this this is kind of the summary paragraphs, right? So I want to I look into this. So I don't think anything... You know, we talked about from Mark 1 to Mark 2 to this paragraph. I don't think any of this should come as a surprise. In a generic statement, um, we certainly have uh, quite a few different types of wild beasts. Um, and I, I think this is talking about living beasts, actually, mostly. Um, because I think that the, uh, the wolds would fall a little bit more into the elemental magics, the dark rituals section. Um, but, you know, either way... It, it, that's a matter of, it, it, that doesn't really matter which is true, but um, uh, Druid Spellcaster is certainly accurate. All of our, uh, nearly all of our Warlocks are in fact of that Druid variety. Um, Savage Feral Warriors certainly covers a lot of different things like the Tharn, pretty much all fall into that category um, to a degree, like even Skinwalkers, things like that fall into that category. Um, some access to skilled range. So we, we actually have a lot more range going in, now that we're in Mark Three and like as we got went through Mark Two than ever existed in Mark One. Um, so like at the beginning of Mark Two, I would say range was still sort of a, a QC thing for Circle. Uh, it's more developed today and through uh, which a lot of which was through Mark Two. Um, but when you really look at the ranged options that we bring to the table we don't have that significant range that like a, a retribution um a signar a legion if you look at the ranged options factions like that have um even if they're not necessarily and let's not confuse what is like considered competitive right now with access right those factions have access to things that are, are by and large significantly farther range right um ravagors are range uh i believe the range 14 pow 15 um just as an example in legion and um defenders that are range 16 pow 15 uh you know things like that to get even close to that we're like the only gun we have that even comes close to that would be something like the fulcrum which is very expensive or the wold wrath which is very expensive uh even the storm raptor doesn't range quite that far so uh you know that's that's going to give you a sense of what they mean when they say that and, I, and that is still largely true today we we do have a lot of range a lot of what we have is short range we have like skirmishy range i would say like blood trackers at range seven wolf riders at range seven we have a lot of range 10 and a few range 12 things um uh, some range eight uh, loki's range eight um we have a lot of spells that are range eight to ten things like that so i would say that that's still true um unparalleled ability to move across the battlefield turn terrain itself against the enemy so um and then uh sort of elaborating on that talks about flight and pathfinder um it this is a big contentious contention spot i think for a lot of people in the faction because they see this but then some of the key pieces in the fact just a just a couple in fact, key pieces in the faction don't actually have access to this. 
Um, and of those specifically, we're looking at the, th the three non-character uh, satyr war beasts, the feral warp wolf, Gedorix, the pure blood warp wolf, uh, although he can warp ghostly, so, um, you know, it's a little different. Um, and I think that's it. I feel like I'm missing something, but, oh, and the Gorax. Um, and so I, f I feel like that when this is said, those things, those things have never had Pathfinder, just to be clear. Um, we did have an Animus in Mark II that gave us access to Pathfinder. We no longer have um, for War... Well, for anything, technically, but it really only mattered for War Beasts. And um, we also... Uh, we also... Shifting Stones, we sort of talked about their ability to place completely... Uh, sorry, within uh, 8 inches turned into completely... Uh, we'll talk about that in this actually a little bit, but it changed in this transition. And so a lot of times, uh, like a Feral or Gedrix, not having Pathfinder wasn't um, necessarily quite the burden that it, it feels like now. Um, and then just thematically, right? So some of those pieces, we don't have really any way to give them Flight or Pathfinder. And uh, there's one spell on one Warlock, and you have to hit an enemy. Um, it's a good spell, but still, those things are all true. Um and for a faction like us to not be able to uh, grant it and not and them not have it when other factions have things like Rush or for their infantry they have things like Rupert or Saxon, things like that. And with Circle not having access to something like that, it feels wrong. Um, so, but let's take a step back from that. So I think that that is a valid criticism to say that I, at the very least, the the satyrs, and we'll talk. They're a little farther down in the article. We'll talk about them more specifically. It's fair to criticize that we're the faction that they're saying this about, but we lack the ability to give it to some key pieces. However, I'm pretty sure if you look across the entire every faction in the game, Circle hands down has more access to these abilities. Um, I don't necessarily know that we have more flight than anybody else. Uh, Legion may be the the primary there, and Legion also has quite a bit of Pathfinder, but most of their infantry does not have Pathfinder. Um, Circle, I think all of their beasts do have flight or Pathfinder, or if not, there's like only a couple exceptions like us, but their infantry doesn't. So as you look, it may feel like this is, uh, you know, you may feel a little bit like this was misguided but it really isn't circle really does actually have access to a significant number of things that can move through terrain we have pathfinder we have flight we have place effects um, which are mentioned down here all things that help us move through the terrain we do have those and we have as i said we there's no I didn't sit down and count it there's no conceivable way we don't have more pathfinder in the game with every single unit um, every single warrior model in Circle has access to Pathfinder, um, with exception of the Skinwalkers, which just have Relentless Charge, giving them Pathfinder in the charge. So, and that's one unit. Um, so you add all those things together, and that, frankly, there's just there is um, there's no there's no comparison. They everything has that. So um, we do have that um, terrain generating spells and abilities. So here's something where I did do a little bit of research on my own, sort of dig, dig, dug into the faction, sort of looked at how many of those do we have, how do those stack up, um, and it really depends on how we look at it, right? We actually have several warlocks, for example, with access to the spell Rift, which just leaves a rough terrain template. Uh, three casters, in fact, I think, have that spell. Um, a couple casters have access to a spell that leaves a forest. We have a couple war beasts that have the ability to leave forest, both wolds. Um, the sentry stone, we'll talk, um, I think is in here. We'll talk about that also leaves a forest. Um, druids can make clouds. Uh, I would say, so I would say like, and we have one caster that can leave a wall. Um, if you look throughout the game, even those, so this, this is another piece I want to dig into because there's another thing that really gets, um, touched on, I think, when people talk about identity, because it's right here at the beginning of this, and I think it's important to look at. But we have, um, now most artists, Pillars of Assault didn't mention that. Um, we have quite a few cloud effects and things like that too. Um, 
something that gets a little bit missed in this analysis is just how rare those things actually are. Now, cloud effects are not. I think every, I think at this point, every faction has the ability to um, do some kind of cloud wall. And I would say more consistently in a lot of cases than anybody in circle, because they just have a like, at least one, I think almost all of them have one warlock that can just go, or warcaster that can just go, here's a cloud. Um, there's probably an exception to that. This was not meant to be all encompassing, but many factions that have never had something like that do now have something like that. And um, uh, with like, and like Signar doesn't explicitly have it, but they do have a couple casters that have the ability to enable trenchers to do a safe cloud wall. Uh, we have druids and misriders that can do a cloud wall, um, but not necessarily what I would call safely because if they're killed, the cloud goes away. Um, so, uh, However, so if we don't count that, we're talking about things like forest and rough terrain. Um, there are some examples of that, but for the most part, the few circle doesn't actually have a ton of things that generate for us. Like I said, two wolds, uh, two casters. Uh, I believe that's right. Oh, uh, sorry, three casters can generate forests. Uh, Mor uh, Morvana has the ability to do that. So uh, you've got Morvana. You've got um cassius and balder they can make forests uh you've got the wool watcher who can make forests the wool warden whose animus makes a forest and i think that's it um and then you have the pillars of salt that mosar has and i think the rest is rough terrain type stuff so um so so i think that that when people read this they expect it to have more uh than that oh and balder too has a rock wall sorry uh people expected that we would have more of those effects um and I, I get that and i actually would love to continue to see us get the ability to generate more of these as well because i think they're a factor um i sort of have brushed over the rough terrain things a little bit because there is actually more pathfinder in the game in mark three than there used to be by somewhat of a noticeable margin i would say or it it, it, this started even before Mark Three. Even going into Mark Two, more things have it. But a lot of theme forces have released, and things have been given Pathfinder, um, and things like that. I, I don't know that all of them do. Um, it's always felt a little bit like they do because in in the War Machine side of things, they've always had access to things like Rupert and Saxon, so they can put Pathfinder wherever they want, and that solo is not very costly. Um, with how Mark Three works, and we'll look at this, I think, in probably another episode more, but. That solo is actually quite expensive, um, not in points, but in what it, uh, in opportunity costs. So um, we'll look at that a little bit more. Uh, keep in mind at the point that this released, uh, theme forces did not exist. So I uh, just want to make sure we're clear about that. So anyways, what I'm getting at is the generation of terrain, specifically forests, is extremely rare. So even Circle having only a handful of them mean is is a lot more than uh than most factions have access to uh that said given that it's sort of a key thing for us and i think forests in particular are a key thing and maybe like like pillars um i would like to see that expanded on certainly um i don't necessarily know what that looks like um there's only so many different ways you can put down uh you know three and four inch templates that are forest uh but i would I would definitely like to see a little bit more of that. Um, but we, I, this was not false, is the thing I want to get at. The, I think there's a lot of accuracy to this, that if you look across the game, you're not seeing forests, pillars of salt, things like that, really appearing anywhere else. There may be some exceptions that I'm, I'm missing, but for the most part, that's it. There's some water effects that appear in minions and one in trolls. Um, and so far we don't have that uh, and there's also some new terrain types that get introduced in mark three uh, specifically like burning earth um there's a there's a snow shroud sort of uh one now too that trolls have in a theme that could be interesting to generate stuff like that uh anyways i just want to point that out um and then also plenty of place effects um we have a number of them. I mean, the ability to put shifting stones in any any list, even though their range it ends up being shortened, is not to be disregarded. Um, 
their utility, they're a little bit more utility in doing that than um, than they previously were. Um, but they, they do allow us to ignore a lot of the table space. Um, we still have access to telekinesis on one caster. Um, trying to think. Uh, we have some teleport things with um, like t the first two Kayas, uh, Balder, Wormwood, a few things like that. So we do have a number of placement effects. I did not do enough research across the game to see like how many, you know, how many factions have access to telekinesis and, you know, if we have the most. I, I don't necessarily want to get into that. I'm more concerned with, with where we are. I do think that there's something to be said for some of the other changes in Mark III. We'll probably talk about those at some point too. Um, okay, and then let's just start looking at a few of the specific. So this kind of goes into some specific things. So um, in the new edition, Circles War Beasts are expanding their access to Pathfinder and uh, similar terrain maneuvering abilities. All three Arguses pick up Pathfinder. Um, they swap their stat lines with Griffins. Um, so, uh, in Mark, in Mark two, Griffins were speed six, defense 14, armor 15, and Griff, uh, sorry, Argus's were speed seven, def defense 15, armor 14, and that effectively has, has flip-flops. So, uh, anyways, uh, in addition to the stat lines Griffins, Griffins are now lightest and fastest in circles living light war beast. Makes sense. They fly. I think this was a very brilliant change, personally. Um, Argus became speed 6, def 14, arm 15. Uh, this is not true of the Moonhound, just real quick. He's 14-14. Um, uh, the Wild Argus lost its range attack in favor of Doppler, Doppler Bark Animus that makes you defense 5 if you're living or undead, if you're within 2 inches, can't run or charge. Uh, this was a fantastic change. I didn't talk about the Argus in Mark II, and that's for a good reason. It was never played. And the reason, it had the Animus that I mentioned that gave Pathfinder, but that was not really a uh, very necessary thing because of the shifting stones that i mentioned and he, he had a, a spray that was wrapped four that caused essentially this same effect to happen uh, but the problem was it was tied to a wrap four which you like if you needed to reduce defense of something significantly like that like hitting a you know needing a like 10 or 11 on a boost for a spray was just not and sometimes a 12 like just wasn't that likely so uh this was a fantastic change this animus has totally made this guy valid um which you can see if you look through some lists in today um it was a very very good change and it kept its flavor by doing so uh also all the arguses in mark two did not have uh sorry the moonhound had pathfinder the other two did not so they all picked up pathfinder uh again a good change so again expanding on the pathfinder a bit um um it Again, I, I know for some people that this is a thorn in their side saying War Beast expanding. It is accurate. Um, they just didn't expand as much as some of us would have maybe liked. Um, also, further differentiation of the satyrs. Um, so that uh, both from each other and the Warp Wolves, all of them went to Fury 3. Um, and the two heavier ones went to Speed 5, um, which makes them economy heavies. Trading, um, bounding for Earth blessing, um, Riphorn lost a point of strength. Uh, talking about their points here, um, the Shadowhorn uh, has the beat back animus now. Is what this is talking about. So, um, uh, the idea here. So, I just want to talk. This is this is less of a. We're we're kind of in flavor here. Um, I really like. Uh, so this is this is a moment where I'm going to be a little bit critical. I really like the direction they took here i think it actually makes a lot of sense to make them more of an economy uh beast um and this sort of highlights this is not a i, I don't think personally um that this is a this is not a an identity problem this is more of an execution problem um, so I just want to point this out. There's a couple pieces that do involve identity. I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, making them bargain uh, economy heavies in the faction is a great direction. Um, where I think that this falls or in current time, and we're not really there, I guess, in my discussion, but we're going to talk about it now anyways. The, the execution here, I think, needs to be revisited. The idea here is great, taking them, because otherwise, if, if it's them and Warp Wolves and you're just constantly comparing, you know, if, if they're both 
18 points, like somebody's going to win out, whoever has the better animus or whoever does just a little more damage, right? Um, so this was a great way to differentiate. I think this needs to evolve, and I think that's one of the things we hopefully see from them when a CID presents itself for them to be included in. Um, but that's an execution thing, so I don't want to, that's pretty much all I want to say about that. Um, bounding came up a bunch when I was asking people questions, and I kind of understand it. It's It was like a threat range extension animus, which most factions have access to. Trolls have rush. Scorn has rush. Slipstream exists in Legion. And then we had bounding. We didn't really ever use it, though. And it very much changes sort of how things work. And it... it I can understand why, especially on a cheaper model, like why they went a different way from it. was also a little bit of a, like clunky to read animus. You went two inches farther and you got plus two on one attack. It was, it, it could have been reworked. Um, I know a lot, there were more people than I thought who brought that animus up as a big um, identity change. Um, so I can only assume that that was sort of more from their personal play experience than the like national meta ever proved out. Um, so that's the biggest reason I want to mention. Um, personally, to the Shadowhorn, um, I think the beatback animus actually is thematic for us. It's a movement effect, right? So if you hit, you can push. It gives us some scenario play that we didn't have before. Um, but the Shadowhorn's old animus really focused on making throws uh, better and more potent, which is also a very circle thing all through Mark 1 and Mark 2 dealing with problems with non-traditional means is sort of our thing. So I was a little sad that we lost that, and I think that there's maybe a little bit there um, I would love to see them revisit at some point. But, um, you know, I think both of those things are in our, like, identity area that we've been talking about. They're just different in what they actually do. So, um, but the Shadowhorn, they don't mention it here, but the Shadowhorn picks up uh, Chain Attack Pitch, so you kind of get it back a little bit there too but in any case uh i was a little sad to see the dynamics go but i think they both still meet um our fluff uh earth's blessing on the narrow horn also does um Warpulfs remained versatile killing machines of the faction uh changed very little except for uh boxes feral got primal uh that was a great change the feral had the worst animus in the game in mark ii uh i don't think i ever used it it's not really worth talking about um character beasts turned out to be more difficult the faction of balance, Gedericks and Brenos went through some lengthy rounds of testing. Brenos is the most changed. Uh, Gedericks also had changes. Um, he uh, has a bond for overtake. He can warp murderous. Those were great changes. Spiny growth as an animus, uh, in my opinion, now that it costs one, is a very good change. Um, there's some pretty lengthy changes here to Brenos. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, I did a video talking about him. But uh, these were actually mostly pretty good changes. Um, it changed almost entirely what he did um i think he probably is another piece that needs to evolve just a little bit more um because giving him these magic abilities is great um but one of them is very one of them is very corner case and the other one is so corner case that i don't think it belongs on a 17 point beast um neither of which makes him bad because his one really good spell is really good but um just worth knowing so i hope to see him evolve a little bit but um Again, good execution. Brenos is very much exemplifies our identity, in my opinion. He's got Pathfinder. He casts spells. He has a blessed weapon. He has reach. He's a war beast. He's got, you know, he has a throw effect. Um, he's good. It, it, it just needs to evolve a little better. He's, you know, he could use a, probably a, just a little bit of attention. So, um uh talking about wolds next wold rate rate of fire changed to a flat three it lost point of fury so that was just solidifying some rules um they changed kind of how geomancy works so this came up before uh, some people mentioned that the fact that we can't cast upkeep spells with geomancy um has been a big change and it has um it's really it's really changed around how you have to look at wolds and i think it's honed in when you want them a little bit more uh and sort of honed in the way to do that. I see this as a balance change. I think uh, if you look at the, you know, if you had looked right when this came out, most people would tell you they didn't care whatsoever about the ability to geomancy spells. Um, but it's proved as the addition has rolled out things like telekinesis, stranglehold, um, 
I'm trying to think of some of the lesser spells like Rift even is a great spell to Geomancy. Gallows is a great spell to Geomancy, things like that. So I think um, this was not met with the reception it deserved at the time, but it was unfortunate. There's some spells that being able to cycle them, uh, things like uh, being able to uh, cast like Curse of Shadows uh, through a Geomancer uh, and not be able to do that. It's a pretty big deal. Um, so they talk about some old Wrath buffs here. Um, those were great changes. The Wrath was not really seen nearly enough in Mark II. Um, but again, I don't know if that's a flavor change. They just sort of gave him what he needed. So uh, those were good. And I think some of, when I say this too, like they gave this thing what it needed, right? A lot of this was looking at what was good in Circle and trying to um, bring the things that didn't get played in Mark II up. I talked about how many lists were very um, similar in Mark II. And a lot of these changes talk about um, a lot of what this is getting at is things that weren't good. Like, what did they need? We're trying to give them little things. We, you know, you kind of see they didn't really do a ton with Warp Wolves, and they didn't because they were mostly played. Um, Gedrix needed it because he didn't fit their mold, but like, you know, you see them talking about the things they're hoping to see people take, take and pay a little bit more attention to. Uh, than they did in editions past. So um, as far as flavor to me, that actually, or identity, that sort of gives us more identity, right? It gives us more potential things that we can include in lists. It already starts to uh, at least show attempts to um, take the faction and and make more things relevant. Um, uh, they talk here a little bit about the forest changes where you have to be completely within... Uh, and how camouflage went away. Uh, those things were apparent to Circle. A lot of people don't like this change. Um, it actually does make Pathfinder more valuable though because you can't just tow models in. It means that you have to have Pathfinder to actually better, like if you want concealment, you're spending a lot of movement unless you can get Pathfinder. So uh, I actually liked this change. I know some people didn't because it makes Prowl much harder to trigger. Um, but you know, you just have to pick a side kind of on that that you like. Um, Circle excels at movement tricks and placement tricks. We also somewhat toned these in the new additions, uh, completely within um, the shifting stones, eight inches, whether using shifting or teleporting rules. Um, so as I mentioned, this was a big change. This um, this was not such a big change in Mark One to Mark Two, but Mark Two to Mark Three, this was very big. It kind of started already with the the change from double teleport in Mark Two going away near the end. Um, and this does change. Uh, this this is an identity. This is a moment where the identity changes. Circle players had to look up how charges worked, for example. Um, you just and that's a bit of hyperbole, but like in Mark II, you try desperately hard not to charge because it costs a, it costs damage, right, to charge generally because um, you're missing out on an attack pretty frequently just to get the distance. So um, this was a big change, uh, and I. I I could have seen this going a bunch of different ways. I think the price point that they put the shifting stones at and the utility of still being able to do this, I think is, um, as well as extending the threats of a few things and being good for some of those short range guns that we have uh, and the fulcrum, which it's not mentioned, but you can place it now. So um, this made the shifting stones a little more efficient for things that want to cast spells and do range attacks and not quite as much for melee. Um, so I would definitely call that a shift in what our identity was in Mark II. Uh, from Mark I, I would say it benefiting spell casting may go back a little bit to what we talked about there. Um, but it was a change, and it was it was one that we should all take note of. Um, Reeves Orbros get um, a flat rate of fire two, but lower pow. That was just a good change. Uh, they were very little seen in Mark One, or sorry, Mark Two. I don't know about Mark One. I didn't hear the, about them there. Um, Prey no longer gave a speed bonus. That was across the game. It was a pretty good change. Um, they're talking about distinguishing wolf riders from blood trackers by... Um, uh, they didn't really replace Prey with Annoyance. I think that's a little misleading. Um, but they, they also don't mention here wolf riders get to be weapon masters in both melee and range all the time. Uh, blood trackers only at range, but they have Prey. Different units. Uh, Blood Weavers got toned down uh, in their ability to kill other living models that are higher armor, uh, but Groove Spoons and Life Spiller um, 
both end up being very good abilities that I think were very underrated at reading this. Uh, losing Dispel in the unit definitely reduced our ability to remove upkeeps. Um, and now we have... Um, this is another... So this is another place I'll be a little bit critical, and we're going to talk about the Druids here. But we used to have a lot of stuff that was anti-magic, and that's been toned way back. And other factions seem like they've gotten... And I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but there's definitely a few places that factions that seem like they shouldn't really have so much access to anti-magic do. Um, like Orn Midwinter particularly sticks out to me. Um, he did that before, but it's a little easier now. And if, a few other things have... Um, uh, I can't remember the name of that ability. It feels like Circle should have something like that, and we don't. Um, we used to have this, you know, Dispel on this unit. Um, I can see why a whole unit having that is problematic. Um, but I do hope that we, like, revisit that and maybe Circle gets a few of those things back as we get some more releases. Um, most change were the Druids of Orboros. Um, we talked about this a bit. Um, but they lost their ability to shut down spellcasting, which was probably the biggest change in my opinion. Um, and then the Force Bolt um, pulls uh, they felt were too abusive. Um, that's interesting because they're still present in Retribution with their Battle Mages. Uh, so it does differentiate them. Um, they felt that it needed to be removed. They do pick up some interesting other abilities. They lost a point of defense. Um, they do get a little bit cheaper overall. Uh, the they gain um, immunity corrosion in in here. Uh, they also get prowl and sacred world. So they used to have camouflage and were higher defense. Um, honestly, I never felt like that kept them alive. I mean, concealment on its own would have been enough. So, um, but gaining prowl and the immunity to elements actually makes them uh, and the and the lack of ability to uh, cast spells at them at them personally is very very good uh apparition is something they picked up that they did not have um which is also actually really good so they lost ad and they got an apparition as sort of the thing that the attachment traded out here um overall i know i'm gonna catch flack for this but i think that the changes made here while i do wish counter magic was still around for a lot of reasons i can understand why something like that was probably too good to be on a unit you could drop into any list and then the trade-offs that they got back for it actually are better uh, i think than most people give credit for i'm going to be playing them soon a bit more uh so we'll maybe revisit them but uh uh but these were a big change a lot of people played this unit and i get why a lot of people's thoughts on the identity of the faction were tied to this particular unit um and it did change a lot and i think one of the things I want to throw out is, and this is part of the purpose of doing this discussion, is, is that um, I want to talk about getting to a place where things are good. So as of the moment that we see these cards, this is a new unit. And that's how I choose to look at them. They're a different unit. They serve a different purpose. Um, they still serve a purpose. Um, they're still playable. Uh... That's not to say that we maybe don't have some criticism of them. Like, I, for example, think Summon Vortex uh, should stay in play when the model is destroyed. Uh, mostly because I don't understand why it doesn't when Trencher Clouds stay. But be that as it may, right? This is this is what they are. And they they picked up some, some other very good things like Pulse of the Earth, which is just a knockdown um, at range 8. Yes, and yes, I know their magic ability is lower. I know they don't have the Devouring, which was a big AoE spell that the leader would cast. Um, Windstrike doesn't pull things in, only pushes them away. But however, they do have the ability to push things out of zones. They are very hard to kill with ranged attacks between being immune to, uh, by, between having stealth and immunity to elements, which a lot of ranged attacks um, are. Um, at the beginning of the edition, there was a lot of true sight casters being played, so their, their value kind of went lower. Um, However, I, I really do think that uh, Apparition is probably, honestly, in, in my play of them, a better effect, actually, than AD was, um, except for, obviously, on turn one. Uh, and the reason for that is it makes them... It actually extends what they can do functionally by two inches with also while giving them a bunch of maneuverability things they can do. So they're different. Don't approach them from Mark II. Um, 
we can talk about how much we loved being able to give Cricks the middle finger just by putting a unit of Druids in a list, um, and I did. Um, and to a degree, I think they still are a good unit to play into Cricks, but um, they're different, and we're going to see them evolve as they get some sort of um, CID process at some point, too. So, um, anyway. Um, and then, just trying to see how much of this is left, because it's actually a bit more than I thought it was. Um, just going to kind of skim through the rest of these. So, uh, next it talks about the Ravagers changes. We've talked about them uh, plenty. Um, all overall, I think those were changes meant to bring them the line. We're going to really see that make sense with the new theme that's coming out. Uh, the changes to the Druid Wilder ultimately made sense as well because there were less anime for her to cast. Um, and can, Shepherd's Call is actually a pretty good uh, ability. Medicaid's a pretty decent ability when you need it. Um, and a free upkeep, which sort of, you know, she's making Fury better in that way instead of the free animus. Um, Kruger's gets uh, immunity to electricity for everybody, kind of trading off his thing that used to make them uh, fearless. Great change. Uh, Morvana just, uh, Morvana 1 uh, got a good change. Morvana 2, um, I'll lament a little bit um, that she had a lot of tricks and most of people outside of Circle felt like there were too many. And a lot of this right here talks about how they apparently felt that way too and toned back a lot of those. Um, I personally think we may need to revisit what Morvana 2 does because I think um, I think a, a bit of her flavor got got missed there too, but I can understand why. She's a very difficult thing to balance, um, and I'd like to see um, some evolution there. But you know, we'll come back to that. Uh, we've talked about Wormwood before. They talk about how um, Wormwood changes. He he gains rapid growth. He becomes the caster. Uh, Grail uh, talks about lots of Wolf Sworn uh, buffs that he got. Uh, Grail definitely stepped in a very positive direction. I know a lot of people are still very eh about him, but gaining for him, like gaining a half inch on his range, um, uh, gaining tactician, uh, trading in death march was was very good changes. Um, Bradigus change. We've talked about Bradigus plenty, of, and this is just sort of talking about some of the early stuff. Mostly house energy was affected, um, and then Chromac too. Um, Talk about how Primal Howl didn't make sense. Vengeful, they felt does. Um, the feet changes. Um, uh, cleaning up there. So that was actually a little bit lengthier than I was planning for. So um, I guess we'll just go with that. But um, so anyways, this insider is really talking about where Privateer Press thought we were going uh, and where they see the faction. So uh, I am... Uh, I, I think everything in this, and, and feel free to go out and, and read this. I'll um, actually try to put the, I'll put this link in the show notes. Go back, read through this. And I think what I would ask, what I did, and what I would ask you to do as you read this is to look at the vision that they had for the faction. Don't look at the necessarily the power ex power level execution of the faction and i think most of the desires they have makes sense to me um did did everything execute perfectly no but that's true for every faction in this game um that doesn't mean don't criticize that but what what i'm getting at is i'm i'm sticking with this to see like we're looking at how our identity is evolving and where it is and where it's going. Um, and this is the first place where it's going, right? These are the things they've highlighted. We've, and as a, and we'll get into this probably in the next episode I do in this series, but the, we've really only gotten, since this article was posted, there have only been, I think four releases for Circle since this article posted. Tanith, Una 2, Kaya 3, Lo sorry, five, Loki, and the World White. There have been five releases. Uh, I apologize. Uh, the Stone Shaper and the Tharn, uh, 
the Thunder Wolf Rider Champion also released. So there's been seven total releases in what is now basically two years um, for us. And some of them, and three of those were Warlocks. Like, some of what's in this article just has yet to bear fruit. Um, and I would keep that in mind, too. We'll talk more about that later, though, too. Anyways, read the article when you have a chance. Uh, take from it what you will. I would say look at the goals. Look at the vision. Um, look, Try to look at the big picture, um, which is how I did it. Um, be, be realistic when you're looking at it, you know. I think it's a valid criticism, as I said above, to say that, you know, it feels very unthematic of certain things in Circle to not have easy access to Pathfinder. Um, but also look at how that stacks up to the rest of the game and how much Pathfinder we actually do have um, and how other factions have to pay for that in other ways. Um, anyways, so uh, I end up rambling through that a little bit more than I wanted to. I'm going to start wrapping it up. Uh, we're, I'll have another episode which is kind of going to start looking at current state and where uh, where I see things moving. That may be one or two episodes. I will see if they start getting this long. They'll probably need to be. Um, and uh, sort of building on on what this is and where I think identity is going. If if you feel like it's been a little bit rambly, it's because this has been a very hard topic to nail down. I mean, identity is a, a complex thing. Uh, in any case, uh, if you have any uh, feedback, feel free to post it on the video and any of the social media that, I, that it gets posted on. If you liked what you heard, uh, try to subscribe to the show or to the channel. Uh, hit the thumbs up button, share us on social media. And as always, uh, thank you for watching.